introduction. So sorry. <laughs> Dr. Atul Bushray, he is the CEO of Atul Bushray Consultants. And he has held some important positions, has almost four decades of uh, experience in the HR in uh, diverse areas as recruitment, training, policy decision. Welcome, sir. Major Cherry Singh. She is the Vice President, Human Capital Management, Yes Bank. She is responsible for branch banking, retail banking, and business banking for Delhi and NCR. She worked with leading organizations like DLF, where she focused on outsourcing HR functional audits and HR vendor and contractual management. Good morning and welcome. And Ms. Seema Bandia, Head HR Mahindra Defense Systems Limited. She focuses on strategic human resource management and competency and re-engineering of HR processes. She has also headed various other projects in compensation and benefits. And, and known for her policies and reward and recognition. Thank you so much. Without taking any more time, I would request uh, the Mr. Dwarka now to be. I don't mind. Okay. So somebody has worked for presentation. Okay. So we will start with uh, we'll start with Ms. Seema Bangya. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. What a day to have this conference teachers' day, and I think it cannot be a better than this day today. Um, thank you so much, ILM, for inviting me over, and especially to Dr. Sanyukta Jolly. Uh, she gave me a theme of uh, unleashing women. You know, can can we see your overall theme? What is it? <coughs> Yeah, it's there behind, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Unleashing potential of women at workplace. So when she gave me this theme, and then there is a sub theme talking about uh, generations, you know, different dimensions. So I will not be covering that the main theme, which is on women, because we have many other speakers who will be covering that, senior than me. So I'll share with you a real time uh, case study, which we did at Mahindra's. It's been going on for the past uh, almost two years. Uh, this is called generational intelligence. Okay, uh, we are looking at uh, various dimensions, you know, across the age groups. So I just uh, I need a remote to control this presentation. Yeah, and uh, while we are doing this, I'll just give you a little background, especially talking about Mahindra Defence. Uh, defense is a sector within Mahindra and Mahindra. We are the uh, uh, one of the sectors. As you know, it's a large conglomerate spread across 12 to 15 sectors, auto sector, IT sector, so on and so forth. So we are one of the sectors as defense sector. And within each sector, there are various legal entities. So for example, in defense, we have six legal entities. One organization which handles the up armored vehicles for the Indian Army and um, I'm glad to share with you that PM Modi also uh, travelled in our uh, bulletproof vehicle while he was doing his ele election campaigning across Gujarat and other parts of India. Uh, so th that's one one company which does that. That's called up armoring of vehicles. The second company uh, does the uh, uh, work for the navy. You know, sea under undermine uh, uh, undersea uh, submarines and electronics and all. So that's one part. Third part is for the radars for the Air Force. So radars go on the aircraft as we all know. So that's what we manufacture or will be manufacturing. The fourth is we have a simulator training for the Indian Air Force pilots. Uh, and then there are a few other businesses which we do. Why I'm sharing with you is just to give you a background, the kind of workforce we have. So we have all age group peoples in our organization coming from the armed forces, retired general, colonels, brigadiers, and then we have other set of people who are uh, engineers coming from the corporate world, and then there are freshers. Though we have very few limited number of women employees, but then of course we have a significant number as well. So what study we did, uh, we conducted our employee engagement survey, which we do that, and we wanted to see how engagement mean to them across um, age group, you know. 
Can, can we have that now? Yeah. So this background I have already given to you, what all kind of work we do, Mahindra Defense. Uh, we're going to move to the next slide. Yeah, our interpretation of general intelligence, current scenario where we studied, where we stand, analysis, uh, what all uh, good changes we can bring into the organization and how we're going to be measuring the success of that. Yeah, next. So first, uh, before we go ahead, we looked at uh, various age bands like baby boomers, Gen Y, Gen X, what age bracket they are, what are their uh, strengths, what, what does motivate them in terms of work, workplace, so on and so forth. So the basis this, next please. I'm just skipping because she said we have 8 to 10 minutes, I don't want to take more time. Uh, we applied various tools, we looked at... Uh, our, uh, as I said, the survey, in-house survey, then we looked at performance appraisal, and the third part, we looked at the um, psychometric tool to assess their strengths and not so good strengths of each age group. Now, this is very interesting, which I'm sharing with you. Just few slides on the data finding. Uh, now, if you see that um, a belief in brand, so if I say I believe in my company's vision, mission, and values, just see how the baby boomers have rated on a scale of 1 to 5 vis-a-vis -vis how my uh, gen X and Y have done. So you'll see that difference you know, coming from. And the big difference is coming from the next statement which is on the teamwork which says I believe different departments work together. Um, so again there is uh, though not much variation but then there is significant amount of uh, even if it is 0.1 we take it as a big difference. Next please. Now this is very interesting. Uh, the second statement, innovation is recognized and accepted in the organization. They say 3.93 and just see how differently the other generation thinks. They think at 1.96. So uh, these, why I'm sharing with you, this is very interesting study which we did and a lot of findings have come out from this. So this has given HR a basis to, uh, you know, uh, apply various kind of interventions. Uh, across to plug in that. Yeah, next please. This is the last one, very important statement. It says I'm satisfied with the current reward system. So my baby boomers, they are at around 3, 2.86. And if you look at uh, the other generations, they are at 1.25. So it means something is wrong somewhere in the system because our policies, processes are same across a uh, group of level of people. Next. Uh, this I'm going to skip. This just tells you what uh, tools we applied to get this. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we did this trend analysis. Uh, how they are, they are more disciplined approach because most of them are coming from the armed forces, the baby movers. The next level is more adaptable, the Gen X. Uh, and why, if you see, they prefer uh, looking at different kind of approaches at work. So uh, various dimensions across generations. Next, please. I think I'll skip that. It's uh, yeah. Uh, we'll just spend a little time on this. Uh, we looked at, as I said, gap analysis through this study, and then we, what we did was we identified focus group areas. We picked up people from each generation plan and made them as a small team, and each team was uh, given a task or area to work on. So that work is going on, and very interesting uh, thing has come up, which is. Uh, Though it's not here, I'll mention with you. It's a new intervention which we call it as Gyan Cafe. It is nothing uh, but then um, anybody uh, takes a session. Let's say if I have my uh, fresher coming in, yeah, and he has a, a very good command. He's a subject matter expert on a on particular area. So he will hold a session where my baby boomers will also attend. So we are creating that kind of learning kind of. Um, organization through this intervention and it came out from here that we have SMEs across generations so why not we use them. And then of course we have cross functional teams, cross uh, age teams and uh, cross uh, gender team as well. Yeah, next please. So I'll end my presentation uh, with this. As you all know we have Mahindra Rise which says accepting no limits 
through alternative thinking and by driving positive change. So anything we do is based on these three pillars of rights. <coughs> so whether it's Gyan Cafe which we launched or we are doing any other intervention, it will be based on these three pillars uh, which, we, uh, which, which is our like uh, value system, you know, uh, it's based on. So what we are doing is uh, uh, we have started appreciating each other's viewpoint. I mean, it, it was there earlier also, but now we are doing it more consciously. Free flow of communication. So it's uh, when it, even when the uh, armed forces people join, they have a complete orientation. We tell them to, you know, I mean, we take them through the corporate culture, how things happen, and especially in, in Mahindra, what are the value systems and all. So when that happens, it uh, leads to free flow of communication. And of course, uh, at the end, it will lead to better understanding. So now I'm very anxiously waiting for my next survey to happen, which will happen in the next uh, couple of months. So we'll see what are the uh, you know results going to come out, whether it will be better than this, or uh, we need to continue doing more work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stress. Dr. Jolly, Seema, Jolly, Durgadaru, Mr. Chaudhary, Mrs. Khanna, and fellow professionals. Um, once again, I know everybody has said teachers' greetings, but it's a nice day to be amongst teachers, Dwarkata. <coughs> and from my greetings to you, uh, I'm going to cover uh, three thought processes. One, uh, and especially focusing on women and gender diversity. The first thought process moves around that it is not something that is nice to do for publicity or for image. We are focusing on gender is actually a business imperative and it actually makes a lot of business sense when you look at the talent pool that is now shifting and the quality of talent pool that is quickly moving differently and data shows that if you see last three years statistics from good business schools or even engineering schools. Engineering schools like low compared to business schools. <coughs> Amongst the top ten or ten people, six are women. <coughs> but amongst the job getters, the top twenty get jobs and not first six. And I'll cover that part as to how in real life I'm I'm a practicing manager, so I'll talk of what happens in industry what happens on the campus and how the gender diversity gets impacted or does not get impacted. So why we have a quality of talent pool highly ignored for simple reason that there are certain biases in the mind of employer that women workforce is not stable. Cruelly, it's talked that, oh, you know, she will work for three, four years, then the mother-in-law factor will come in, then the first baby will come in, and then the kitchen will become more important. This is very derogatory, uncalled for. Because when we look at talent, we look at talent pool as one big cake, not the slice of the cake. We are trying to increase, we should be attempting to increase the size of the cake itself and not the slice of the cake by saying, oh, we have 11% women workforce. And I'll cover this part as we go along with some live examples from my past. I'm, I've, I've been very passionate about Dr. Garu who bear with me on issues of gender diversity in whichever companies I've worked with, say Shell or Motorola or IBM. So talent pool, if it needs to be expanded, organizations will have to look at issues which concerns women, not for women, but about women. I'll give you a live example. When I joined Shell Malaysia, my second day or third day in the office, <laughs> I was going to attend one particular meeting and I entered the wrong room. And suddenly I saw about 15, 16 ladies very animatedly discussing something. So I was curious and I'm used to say, what are these women doing in that conference room? And when I asked them, they said they were part of SWARM, a Shell Women's Affinity Network. Shell is very highly com um, committed to diversity. And this SWARM is a global organization where women meet together to discuss issues concerning women workforce. My first reaction was, why there are no men here? And the Arkagaru, you very rightly referred to it, that this is not about a hen party, that women sit together and um, talk about how they are being exploited, they are not giving opportunity, beat the chest and say, oh, you know, we are not being given equal opportunity. 
this is pure business meeting. So I asked them, I said, maybe after my meeting I'd like to meet you guys. Why do you meet only amongst yourself? And at what level do you have decision makers there? <coughs> Point one, issues in organizations is not about, it is not for women, it is about women. And there are male employees, male leaders who are committed to the cause of diversity, they must be included. The first decision we took that evening was that they included the vice chairman and a close friend of mine later on, Zainul Rahim and myself. And we became butt end of jokes in the lunch room that we had John Swan. That aside, having two decision makers in that body, there were issues which are coming up from Swan, which are real issues affecting the women workforce. And fortunately, two of us were in a position to take corrective action and sh show that this company, when it talks of commitment to women, it also means commitment to action for women. Uh, <clears throat> way back, and I like your example, Dr. Garun, in 75 when you had bus transportation. I did something in 94, <laughs> much later. Uh, we set up a factory, in, uh, when I was in Motorola, we set up Electronic City. I don't know if you're familiar with Bangalore, 22 kilometers from Bangalore is Electronic City. Motorola, for whatever reason, globally, had no union policy. Not that they were against it, but the policy was that if you have one-on-one -on -one contact with each other, which is committed to the uh, company, then you would not need third party. Having worked in Korea and China, and setting up centers there, where unionization is very strong, and in India, one of the strategies we took, learning from garments factory in old Madras Highway, is that the more women workforce men, less union data. So we took a strategic decision. 85% of the workforce in electros, electronic city fact, factory would be women. They're not doing anybody a favor. That's my first point. This is business decision. It impacts business. To hire people to travel 22 kilometers was difficult in 94 because in a culture, in a very conservative People who are diploma holders in ITI, girls from that family, were expected to return home by 7.30. Nowadays in BBO, girls leave at 7.30 in the evening and come back at 8.30 in the morning and parents feel proud about it. But to do that, a lot of education had to be done. Plant visit had to be organized, but it paid us dividend. It got us a workforce and in other businesses, our attrition started falling. Because people realize that this company is sensitive to the gender. And as a result of that, we became more role model employers to attract good quality talent, both male and female. In IBM, we started tracking when I came from Malaysia to join IBM in India, it was 16%. All this presentation would talk about 16.2% women workforce. And the you know, industry is 15%, so we are 1.x percent. <coughs> Didn't excite me at all. What does percentage mean? If you look at the data in any organization, if you put a triangle and take a triangle and divide by four parts, equal parts, you'll find most of the women workforce are in the lower strata, some in the second strata of the triangle, very few in the top strata. And we then we brag about percentages, it is counterproductive. Just by having X number of people, okay, IBM we went up from 16% to 27.2%. In less than two and a half years. By sheer tracking, asking the recruitment team not only numbers, how many CVs have you received and how many interviews have you held. Moment you ask questions, moment you demand data and facts and figures, things improve. But we were not still happy because the pyramid, the triangle, people were coming at the lower part of the triangle, not at the upper part. Now, this is too big an issue to address in 10 minutes. But the fact is that if you bring focus attention to an issue, solutions will then be found. We started looking at leadership development. Raj Nehru very rightly mentioned in the first session, you got to have special programs for women, and you also referred to that. That you got to not just treat them specially, but at the same time make sure that the glass ceiling, so-called glass ceiling, is as much removed as is practical to do. But in all this, comes the last part of my thought that women have a role to play also. You can't be conveniently choosing to be a woman at one time and co-worker at the other time. 
So if I have to go early today, you now I'm a mother. Don't you have realized that I have to leave this meeting and go home? That's convenient. But if you work 11 o'clock at night, better work. Then and then only the equal opportunity will come into traction. If women want, and sometimes you see at the light in the railway station or a movie theater, women will come in straight large. I'm a woman, so I must get preference. But otherwise, they say you must give me equal opportunity because I'm a woman. You can't eat your cake, have it to and take some home also. <laughs> so here, one live example. I was heading HR for Shell Malaysia and Brunei. And we used to have this very high powered 20 odd fresh graduates join us every year from INSEAD, Harvard, and <coughs> AIM in Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Manila. Very high powered group of potential leaders. And one of this badge, one of the ladies from that badge came to me and literally made it sound as if she was complaining in discrimination. An engineer by training. Petrochemical and energy engineers are very rare trade. What was her complaint? That all the training programs for engineers include a six week stint in the rigs. You know, the rigs are about 40 45 minutes chopper ride from the mainland, and conditions are very, very tough, both physically and otherwise, isolated. They work for six weeks and then they get off for six weeks. And we will send women there. And she came and said, Why not? I'm an engineer, I'm qualified, and I want to work. I want to get the same experience as my male counterpart. Now here's a dilemma in the HR head. I'm using a excuse of safety, aloofness. I'm actually contradicting myself. So he said to that and said, okay, now this is a positive problem to tackle. Would you really like to go? Why don't you go for three weeks? And she says, you treat me equally. Six weeks is six weeks. We took it on. And when she went there, two things happened. The entire atmosphere in the rig changed. First time a lady engineer was joining them and she was as hard working if not more and it made people nervous to say, if she can do it, how can we not do it? People stopped cribbing about, oh, we are isolated, we have to working very hard, 24 7, 25 by 7. And she showed the way and it opened eyes for us many ways that if you treat them equally, provided, they have a safety net for their welfare and safety, not compromising. It makes a big difference to the talent workforce and the talent pool in Bruce. Third is to recognize that motherhood is a biological requirement. An organization has to accept that she will go away from work rather than see it as an exception, put it in the process. And very likely, the other will mention about re entry. Out of sight, out of mind. People are scared to go on long leave. Even ordinary leave, people say, don't go on such a long leave that people say, hey, without you, things work better, actually. <laughs> so when they go on vigilantly leave, and when they come back, but then we have to give them training, and we tried it very successfully in Motorola and Shell, that during the absence, we would make sure that they got all information about the department, everything that was happening was fed to them and their views taken. Maybe not directly, video conference, mails. Idea is to integrate them and treat them with respect and equality rather than do a favor, oh, you are lying down there pregnant, but don't worry, we'll look after you. No favor. <clears throat> One surprising part that I noticed, and in, in IBM I had a lady boss who had a lady boss. So I worked with two generations of lady bosses and I was wondering how anybody would react to working for a living. It was a phenomenally refreshing. They were as demanding if not more as my previous bosses who were males. Nehru mentioned his team, I had 65% or 70% in my team as women. And the male members used to jokingly say, how about practicing diversity? We are in minority. But all this combination, and I realized some watching some women leaders, that women leaders themselves sometimes are the biggest enemy of women employees. For some reason, I can't say why, how, data, but they don't want to see other women succeed. And that phenomenon perhaps is something that I don't have any data on, but it's sad to see that instead of having a helping hand coming from somebody who's correlating emotionally, mentally, and socially, we are the biggest burden coming from women about other women employees. That aside, I think time has come where we'll have to make sure that the policies of the future, and we're talking about the generation and moving out, 
will have to be such that it attracts both male and female with equal opportunity. That the policies are not sacrosanct. Many of us in the HR community are born with this stubbornness and pig-headedness to say, here's a book, page number 55, clause number 22, says no. What is your question? The answer is no. Now what is your question? I think those days are over. We have to be more sensitive to new generation employees, meet their needs, and amend without any compulsion, as long as two things are addressed. Organization interest is not compromised just to become <coughs> diversity friendly or become nice and decoded in business world and best place to work in. I'm against those surveys as a personal professional uh, because they are more marketing gimmicks and more showmanship. But that aside, if it makes business sense and if it is fair to women and is sensitive to their needs, I think we should be bold enough to take the decision. Thank you for inviting me, ma'am. I'll request Major Cherry Singh to please come on stage. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, IRM Fraternity for having invited me here on this special occasion on Teacher's Day on a topic which is very close to my heart as an individual and as a professional being in HR today. I I come from a very diverse background, having spent seven years in the Indian Armed Forces, started my career in 99, and having 15 years of experience and moved into the corporate about eight years back. I think I've seen both sides of the world. I, I won't say I'm uh, Gen Y, I'm, you know, 15 years back, 99. When we started career, the policies were rigid when it came to actually women employees. And I'll start my, uh, uh, I don't have a presentation, but with an example, when, you know, doing a training amongst 300 uh, men, being from an organization where there are 2% women and 98% men, uniformed men, it's quite a challenge. We have a lady officer here, Captain Aparna, with me, and you know, I don't know if times have changed in the armed forces, but I'm talking about uh, 15 years back when I started the profession. Having gone through that rigorous training amongst those 350 uh, male officer colleagues and joining an organization, uh, one of the organizations where I was in, Central Ordnance Depot, Allahabad, as a lieutenant, and coming from that army background, where you've seen your dad being in uniform, all your friends, parents being in uniform, so you know the culture. I remember being sent for a firing uh, youngest officer newly commissioned, nothing to do, Abhya kya firing karai hai. Okay? So, lady officer, ja kya firing karai Okay, so you are a range officer and standing there and looking at people firing and uh, the Jawans fire and then the JCOs are there and I, see, I saw one JCO firing in the air. So when you're firing, the sound of the bullet goes, you know, it, it echoes in the air. So you can make out that somebody who's firing in the air not hitting the target. And I'm a national level shooter. So I went and stood beside those JCOs and I figured out who's the JCOs firing in the air. I went and said, Saab, apna position ti kariye. So that Saab gave me a look that one deep bag she's got commission. I'm a 54 year old man. And she wants to tell me apna position ti kariye. What does she think she thinks of herself? Because I could make out in his eyes that, you know, this guy was really furious. Why am I saying that in front of so many JCOs? And he says, I said, Saab, apna position ti kariye. I was very full. And this guy again gave me a look, G Saab. And again he would fire in the air. I went down. He was lying down. I pulled one his leg straight, straight to the target. The other leg where it's supposed to be. And I told him, this weapon of yours is supposed to touch the sack. Till the time, if you're doing a firing in line position, you do not touch the sack, you will not get the support. Get your position correct and then fire. And he fired and the, it hit the target, but somewhere the target. And uh, obviously, out of 10 rounds which he fired, he just made it to one, one bullet on the target. And he looked at me, and the last round, everybody said, officers needs to fire now. Okay? So everybody's looking at me. This lady, young officer, one week back, she's coming. Let's see how does she fire. Uh, being a national shooter, there were five bullets I could fire in one centimeter. And this JCO, whom I pointed out, he ran to see my target. 
how did he fire? <laughs> and he looked at me, I went to him, and he came and he saluted, he said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I realized at a very early age, at 20 and a half when I got commissioned, that it's very important for women to prove their worth in this world. I realized it 15 years back, things have changed. Now being in HR, I would cover my topic, which is a very interesting uh, topic, Unleashing Women Potential in the Corporate. I would cover it in three uh, you know, important parameters. One is what, is what does the organization expect from the employees, be it male employees or female employees. One is having a productive force, right? Having loyalty from the employees or the longevity, do not lose good talented people. That's one of the very important parameters that I or any HR person, you know, so would agree would actually look at. Do not want to lose talented people. Women, as you grow in your career, get married, have kids, somewhere down the line the aspirations that you had a few years back, you know, it goes down. You don't know what to do. You get confused whether I should focus on my family or should actually continue with my career. I would say there are different HR practices that uh, today the organizations, not only I will talk about the banking or the FSI sector, I will talk about uh, FMCG or uh, uh, you know IT industries that they are focusing on. A couple of uh, uh, women friendly policies in place which would help us get that talent back in the corporate. I'll give examples of a couple of practices which are very known and which have just been introduced as uh, uh, women-friendly policies in the organizations. One is being in Yes Bank, you know, one, one thing that we focus on is hire women. Uh, I have about 150 branches in Delhi and Siam. Uh, fathers being Alwar, uh, this side being Panipat, Ghaziabad, Greater Noida, and about 50 unbanked locations. We made a practice we will not hire women for unbanked locations which are rural areas because definitely it becomes difficult for women to travel at the night and come back safely back home. We do not hire as a policy. Uh, hiring women for the branches which are closest to their house. This is one of the main criteria that we have. We have 20% women employees in the bank today in branch banking and uh, all the women, they stay three kilometers radius around the branch. Even if the branch closes at 7.30 in the evening, they're back home by around quarter to eight. If it closes at 6.30, they're back home in 15 minutes. That is one of the important policies that we have and we focus on in the bank. Second, flexible working hours. You know, you come at uh, many organizations, they follow that. Banking, it is not possible. But one of the things that we follow is you want to start your uh, day at 6 o'clock in the morning and finish at 1.30 so that you're back home with your child. You can do that. You want to work from 10 to 6, you can do that. You want to work from 11 to 9, you want to do that, you can do that. You need to complete your eight hours of working hours in the organizations, uh, in an organization. So what timing do you want to follow is up to you. Work from home policy, definitely uh, technology plays a very important role, you know, having a data card in place. And, you know, if you want to work, the child is not well, if there's some exigency at home, we allow women working from home that attracts and that makes us retain a lot of women employees back home. Half work, half salary. Okay, this is very important and very interesting. You know, you don't want to work for eight hours, work for four hours and take half of your salary. There are many women who went on maternity leave, they came back, you know, taking that, okay, I was making 10 lakhs an annum, now I would make five lakhs, I'm okay with it, I'll spend four hours. I'll work from nine to one and I'll come back home and look after my family. I'll take half the salary. Crash, there are many organizations which have crash and uh, you can take your kids and women feel you know comfortable having kids around. They can go in between and, and during breaks can go and look at the child. Uh, in PNG, I was reading, they have a zero uh, uh, in retention, attrition and maternity leave because of uh, crash facility and maternity leave policy that they have. They ensure that every lady, till date, they have a zero attrition on ladies who have more, uh, who've gone on maternity leave. None of their ladies or lady employees who have gone on maternity leave have not come back. They've come back and joined the organization back because of the flexibility in the policies that they have. 
There's something called as, uh, you know, in ICIC Bank, when I was with ICIC Securities for five years, there's some policy called as take care leave. You know, we allow women to take care, you know, take leave, which is over and above the maternity leave. Once in two years, which is for two months, to take care of a child who's below two years of age. So once in two years, you can actually take two months of uh, take care leave for a child, which is small and is over and above and fully paid. So you will find a lot of women not leaving that back because of the, you know, the flexibility and kind of policy that they have made around women, which make them stay with the organization for ages. Uh, there's something called as leave pooling policy. I don't know if you've heard about that. It's like, I don't have leave because of family exigency. I'm away on leave. I would request a colleague of mine, you have 30 days, why don't you pool in 10 days to me? Give me those 10 days. And the person has the authority to give those 10 days to Cherry. And I can use his 10 days. And it gets deducted from his leave and gets accumulated in mine. And I take those 10 days. So I'm very friendly. It bonds the employees. One of the most friendly policies that I've heard of and would really would love to implement it in coming times in the organization because it bonds employees. Somebody is in need, you're able to help that person. You don't need to, you know, it's fully paid, so you're giving 10 days of your leave to somebody who's in need. One of the policies, adoption leave. Initially, it used to be a biological maternity leave. People used to take three, day, three months or four months of leave every organization gives. Adoption leave is one thing where mothers these days get as long as we're giving it in maternity leave. So four months of adop adoption leave is also being given in an organization, even in us. Uh, there, are, there is a policy called as cramming up five days of work load in four days. So you work extra hours till nine o'clock in the night, cram up your work, and you take two days off. I don't have a problem. You've got to be productive. You need to complete these many hours in a week. Do that. Take care. I'm saying these, all policies for women, what we have made is to increase the diversity in an organization. But definitely what, you know, Sir said that women should not take an advantage of it. It's very important for women to know a couple of things. First, what is your priority in life? Be clear, what is that you want? What is your aspiration? If you want to work, give it your best shot. You cannot say, I'm a woman. I want to leave early today. You cannot do that. You want to be paid equally to men. You want to get the same opportunities. You want to be part of the board of directors. You want to be a leader like any other man. Hold the cluster leadership position or a regional leadership position. But do not want to put in those extra hours which men are putting. That's not good. So if you want to be there, you have to give your best shot. And believe me, organizations are working towards flexibility in terms of providing everything to retain women employees. One last thing which I would say is uh, I have a seven-year-old son and I was in Wipro's on women, uh, Women's Day, they have called me as a guest speaker to share my experience and one of the ladies asked me that how do you balance your family life and with work and getting to a complete and and traveling. I just said one line, you know, uh, leaving my six months old child when I left him for the first time was as difficult as it would be leaving a six-year-old for the first time. If I had continued working for the next six years, for the first time I had to come back to job, and I had to come back after the sabbatical, as difficult as uh, it was for me when I left my son who was six months old. I know what I want in life. Second is, I do not get into a guilt. I have not been able to cook. I have not been able to teach. I outsource it. <laughs> so, Cooking is outsourced. <laughs> I have an Indian student who is very generous enough to come and uh, teach, my uh, teach my son in the evening for one hour. And he's doing well in his studies in the first class, so I've outsourced that as well. So I don't have the guilt of not cooking for him. So I cook for him on Sundays. <laughs> so that is one thing you do. I would request uh, all the ladies here, the aspirants, there are a lot of students here. Please be clear of your aspirations, what you want to be in life. Believe me, sky is the world. And you can achieve what you want to achieve. Um, one of the examples, just eight years in the uh, corporate world, and I think uh, uh, the opportunities that the corporate has and the flexibility that today I see in terms of uh, having the policies.
They are not as rigid as I saw when I started my career. Uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you for having me around. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now I'll request Mr. Dwarkana. Respected fellow panelists and Dr. Samipta Jolly, I'm glad that Mr. Rai is here to support Mrs. Rai. <laughs> and uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, have you realized that uh, we are in minority? <laughs> who said, um, Sherry, who said you are, you are not Jan Y? You are Jan Y. I wish one day we have Chief of the Army a lady. Uh, I said, I can only assure you in the next 10 minutes, uh, I won't repeat what I said, but I'll pick it up from what has been said. I think it's important we understand what is the topic in which we are talking about, um, uh, which is talking about how do the, what are the dimensions in terms of across generations, because Gen Y and all that. I think a lot has been said and very inspirational to hear from Seema Chari and uh, Akil Bai in his own style with the varied experiences he has shared. I don't want to keep on dwelling on the points we said. I think we, somebody talked about earlier the confidence. Who said ladies do not have confidence? You have a lot of confidence. It's only you need to experiment it and see it happen. You can take great decisions. I have no issues on that. I'm not just saying for the sake of saying. Women power is very, very important. Women can do many things which perhaps with their influencing style with their own um, parental style, they can bring a lot of influence, not only in the families, not only in the society, but also in the corporate world. I just want to touch on three points. I think most of this unleash the potential of human power depends on three factors. One is the corporate businesses, second thing is society, third one is family. I think you need to get support from that. If you're talking about a joint family, you know who is the who is the head of the family at home? Mother-in-law. I think, you know, so I think Atul has said it. I think these are the factors. And secondly, we suffer from another syndrome in India, a square syndrome. Apart from men dominate society, you know, someone can say, what is a square syndrome? We suffer from age and authority. I mean, I think if I'm elder to Chari or Seema, I think as a HR guy, whatever I say is right or Atul said is right. And uh, you can't challenge it. And she was saying that when she was saying, take a position, he said, how can you tell me? My experience is not equal to age. I think that is the syndrome. I think that is the change in the mindset which is required. I think, you know, sometimes you suffer out of it, but you need to take it on board and move on. I'll give you some, uh, some uh, anecdotes which I said. This is the case in a factory which I was working. We want to communicate to the em employees are paid very well. But you know, still there were many of them when they were indebted and all. How to communicate to the family? Families didn't know how much they're getting. And secondly, always we used to have a problem. The cause was somewhere, but the effect was somewhere else. Uniforms were not stitched properly. You know, one of the one of the young girls whom I recruited as an apprentice, she has done a social work. She went and started um, mingling with the families and all. She came back and said, sir, uniform is a big issue. Though we are doing it well, they're making a mess out of it because they just want to create an issue because they have some other grievance somewhere. I said, she came with an idea. Why can't we teach the wives of the workmen tailoring and stitching? And they're all, you know, it's a small place near Andhra. And we started investing on that small tailoring institute and all that. <laughs> Next year, we're given all the uniforms to the wives of the employees, after that there was no problem. Okay, nobody could say the stitching was good, quality was good. I think, you know, there are various ways of addressing it. I think, you know, there is no fixed formula. I agree with um, Cherry. First Break All Rules is a great book by Mark Buckingham. That is what is will accumulate. When I talked about it earlier, session 1975, Lady Winter Taxi Service, today is outdated because you are doing. But the context is important. 75, there is something very... In 90, you know, 90 GSK thought about flexi working hours. We did one mistake. We went only for the first ladies. Then men said, why not? I think there is where uh, you, you, we started about the paternity leave. Do you give paternity leave? Yes. I think, you know, this is one way you're supporting. You're not giving to men, but you're supporting your 
women leaders. I think you know that's important. The other bit which you will be surprised, uh, we all do mistakes, I tell you agree, we all do mistakes. I've done a greatest blunder in hiring. I had this stereotyping that for a factory HR you need to have only gems. Ladies cannot do it. This is a this is a mistake, this is thinking. So what we did, I went to Excel one year. I was garrowed by girl students because he said, How why not we consider us? I said I thought about it, fine, I hired two ladies. Yeah. After that, they went to the factory. But I told him, I can't discriminate, you can't go to the factory, I want in corporate office. They said, no, we'll go for training. They went there. There was a garao in the factory. And uh, the union leaders came and said, uh, Bahinji, aap ja sakta hai. These two girls said, there were only two girls in the factory. They said, we will not leave unless we leave our colleagues. So they have to leave everyone. I think, you know, this is what, I think, you know, they, you can do wonders provided you have the courage and conviction to do it and provided the environment is good. I think this is where a little bit of give and take takes place, what Cherry was talking about, what Paki Bhai was talking about, Seema. I think it's important. This is a handshake, is bringing two hands together. I think you need to make effort. Don't think you are discriminated or if there's some of the policies are demeaning. Is nothing like that. As I can say, is as long as there is safety net provided, I uh, mean, in some situations is required because of social cultural uh, context. I think you know you need to take it on board, and and you know you'll be surprised if you see how HR policies can be dynamic. This is where the HR, the corporate can play an important role. And GSK had a policy that you, if you marry a colleague, one of them have to leave the company. Who do you think normally people used to be when they get married to colleagues? Women. Okay. Then some of the women met me. I said, what is this policy? I started, this was in 82. I started thinking. You know, sometimes to break rules is difficult. It's not easy when you are in a working in a very structured organization. It took me two years, three years. to check with many multinationals. They have different policies. So I said, fine. You know, after that, our retention strategy, retention was so high and there was so much, there were a lot of people who worked together or studied together, but they never had any, any friendship. When they get, they get married, they work together with us for many years. I'm just saying, you know, this is not from a commercial perspective, but I think it flows in the interest. That that's why diversity helps you in many respects. It is not just uh, one of the factors is, of course, business growth and business dynamics, but having said that, how the culture of the organization can change and how it can help you. But at the same time, we need to be sensitive to the both the genders. I, I just give you one example. This is a town hall meeting in Patna. A young, um, all sales force, young sales force were sitting. Most of them are boys. It's about age of 22 to 25. And uh, after some time, you know, they have only one grievance. They raised with me and sales director. They said, sir, we are paid very well. Normally people talk about compensation salaries. We are paid well, looked after well. We have only one grievance. I said, what is the grievance? He said, job title. I think, what is the job title? My job title is sales rep. My parents are looking for alliances for me. None of the people are interested to join because it's a, his job title is not that great because I keep traveling. I said, okay. We came back, we thought about it. In soils director and decided, okay, titles have been changed from today. You have been made sales officer. I think, you know, I'm just saying whether it's a girl or a boy, the issue is that you, do you have a mind which is collaborative to, to address the issues? As, as we said, what policies are the best practices after some time become normal practice. I think, you know, it depends. Again, there is no one size fits all. I think don't think, you know, sitting, I mean, I'm just saying, don't mistake me, teaching profession, I will have a flexi hours. You can't. I mean, you, in some areas, if you say nothing, you, I mean, if I say, secondly, numbers have no meaning sometimes, statistics. Okay, max group. If you say max healthcare, I can give you a fantastic statistic, what is the women versus men. I said healthcare, we have 65%. But, you know, if you get to a manufacturing, it will be 5%. So, I think, you know, the quality of the the impact, the culture, the way you think, the way you act, the walk, the talk is the most important. There's no point in being saying I am in favor of the 
women. We do have very progressive policies, but you know, do not try to, I mean, try to understand the policies of others and try to implement and execute what it suits you. The context is important. It depends on the sector, depends on the situations, depends on the factors. So don't expect everything to be copied. There is no one size fits all. But at the same time, there is an opportunity to think innovatively to make it happen, as I said, as bringing as a shake hand, which needs to a collaborative approach. Last, but uh, the last point, you know, which is very important, I think we sometimes we tend to is most from my own personal research, I realized the women who are made to the top in the board level or senior levels, where they get a lot of support from the spouse and from in-laws or from the family. I think, you know, I have seen many cases, they have done it well. I think it's important that we are addressing only some segments of it. I think we need to, you see, the segments who are sitting is only part of it. There are others who are not here. How we need to educate them and make it happen is also important. Maybe it's in coming in the TV, how a rural girl has qualified for IPS. I think, you know, these are some of the stories, you know, which you bring. You can, so my message to all of you, especially to the women leaders are you can do wonders you have the power please unleash that potential and make this country great thank you very much thank you very much um, i'd like to open the floor for questions we can have probably just one question because we are running very short of time One question from you to understand what survey did you use? Uh, you skipped that slide for getting this engagement data. What particular survey was there? And do you see a real differences with dealing with Gen Y and Gen X since you have, uh, you know, such a diverse population that works for you and one coming from uh, the forces which comes from a different discipline and like Cherry mentioned from a very patriarchal, paternalistic kind of approach and the Gen Y, which uh, whatever research says seems to be thinking very differently. So what challenges do you face while dealing with them? And uh, the same question is also for Cherry. I think you deal with a similar kind of set. Okay, uh, you asked two questions. The survey which we used was designed in-house. It's called MCARES and M-C-A-R-E-S. It stands for, uh, you know, uh, like M stands for uh, membership, C stands for care, so all like that. So we have developed this in-house. We don't depend too much on external surveys. And we have a team who designs it uh, sitting at uh, our head office in Worli. Uh, yes, we handle diverse uh, workforce, all age groups as I mentioned. Now we are looking, revisiting some of the policies. Yeah, For example, comp and ben compensation benefit policy. Maybe at that stage, at baby boomers, they want to invest more in their provident fund, superannuation, whereas your Gen Y, they don't want to shell out so much in the investments. So we, this is one example I'm giving. So we are just uh, visiting, revisiting all these policies and just trying to tweak it, make it flexible, as they said. And uh, that's the need, actually, if you want to survive, really, with this kind of workforce. Because it won't work, same policy won't work for all of them. Yeah, so that's one example. Over to Cherry. Okay, uh, we participated in Great Place to Work survey last year, and there were a lot of uh, feedback that we got from the employees. And uh, uh, one of the uh, feedback was uh, on leave. We have 25 days of PL that we have, and paternity leave is just about two days. And there was a disconnect, and people, you know, the male employees are very unhappy about that. We worked on the uh, leave policy for the organization and in fact we added on one more policy, you know, called as one day special leave. So in a year over and above your PL and maternity leave or any other leave, you can take one day of special leave which is on your birthday or your spouse's birthday or on your anniversary day or on your child's birthday. So this is over and above. And secondly, we introduced one Saturday off in the month. Otherwise it's half days. In banking, because you need to open the bank all six days, you cannot close it. So we introduce something called as one Saturday off in a month. We do a lot of regional surveys because uh, very important to understand what kind of requirement or what kind of you know needs are there amongst employees. And it may differ from uh, northern India to southern to east and west. So it's regional specific. The feedback that we get, we try and implement them 
Zsírsteri. You know, sometimes this research are not theoretical or uh, academic because they give you, like Jerry says, gives you the pulse of the people. And sometimes small issues, which are not really worth talking about at big forums, get surfaced. Give a typical example, we had this policy of uh, leave lapsing at the end of the year in Motorola. And we said, uh, why would leave lapse? Because we do believe in work-life balance, you must take time off. And if you don't take time off, then the leave would lapse. Now, it's easy to say all this in nice air-conditioned office, but when it comes to grassroots realities, the managers don't give leave because they say, oh no, you can't have parking, you're spending this and that. So we started, on, based on that feedback, we started a new thing called leave bank. You could donate leave from your account in advance, one minute is lapsing. In the beginning of the year, you could donate some leave to bank account. And we created the corpus of leave actually, actually like corpus of leave. Anybody in dear, real dire straits or real genuine trouble could actually, after exhausting his or her leave, could dip into that bank. And there was a small team of three people who would monitor the genuineness of the request. Now all this happened because the feedback from the employees was taken seriously. Become benchmark practice in its time. That you know, we are not spending any money. Instead of lapsing of leave, people would say in advance, I'll give five days of my 25 days leave to a bank. So listening to employees is part of the solution. It's not just listening for the sake of it. If you don't listen, you're not doing a good job anyway. But if you listen, you are actually providing solution, even if you're not providing solution. Share listening. Uh, we faced the same uh, similar problem two years back, employees saying that my, mo my boss doesn't give me leave. So I have 25 days, I'm left with 20 days. What do I do? Uh, RBI came with a guideline that every employee must take leave every year. So we introduced something called as MCL, uh, this is mandatory compliance leave in the organization. So yes, that has something called as mandatory compliance. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, depend on what level you are, in case you are a cluster level or a branch level, we give you two weeks off. You're supposed to be off phones, off your mobile, off your laptop, not supposed to respond to anybody and nobody's going to question you. So you just take off. And every employee, 100% employees, be it a frontline sales employee or a person at an executive director level, needs to take 14 days off in a year. So that ensures everybody's taking leave and we do not have that problem of you know leave getting wasted by the end of the year. So that's one thing that we have implemented recently. You see, I think the point you're making whether any difference between the genders in Gen Y, I don't think so. And I find, you know, Gen Y, I mean, I'm not without any data, I don't want to say they are as assertive as they're, and if you don't satisfy me, someone else will as an employer. Job security is not an issue, it's a job satisfaction. It is not the content, it's the context. Those are the very important uh, themes. I mean, uh, don't control me, collaborate, don't critic, but coach me. Don't monitor, but mentor. I mean, these are the trends, you know, which is coming. So I think there's no difference in this. I think the only thing is first break all rules. It's, as I said, I think it's an evolving, a dynamic process. You need to be creative. It's neat. But at the same time, you need to understand there are certain aspects. Every organization cannot do the same thing. You know, I think you need to. And secondly, I'm not trying to be a, give a caution or something. We in India, sometimes we tend to misuse the facilities given. I think you know that is where sometimes people tend to withdraw. So don't give that scope. It is not a, it's not ladies only, but it's also gender. Say you're talking about working from home. Working from home in India is a different context. You go to the market. Uh, and you know, in US and UK, if you're working from home is really or devoted, but you can't you can't come to the office for some reasons. You do child care, you do elder care, doesn't matter. And secondly, and it depends on the context sector, don't say why this company is doing, I'm not doing. I think these are the cultural issues. I think each one has a different evolution, but I think it's a great challenge to have. I think it's a positive challenge, which we should address. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the esteemed panel for sparing their time to come. A round of applause and we can start.